Okay. Okay, welcome to the second lecture of QFT. A few bookkeeping things. Johnson is having his session on complex analysis today, uh, which is very useful, as you guys all know. Those of you that are doing research projects, we should meet at some point to touch base uh, on, on just how things are going, if you've read anything interesting. I have a few more ideas, stuff for you guys to look at. So we should meet at some point. I'll send an email out. Okay, so where are we going? So uh, this is awesome because now you guys have the textbook. I know what you've read. So this is perfect because you'll see my calculations are very different. Uh, I assume they might be identical. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm counting on you to sort of tell me what the level is. If you feel like the level needs to be a little slower, that's fine. Just let me know. If you feel like it needs to be faster, that's also fine. Let me know. Uh, we, we don't have any exams to take in this class. That's the beauty of it. Uh, we're here to just learn. We're here to learn the subject. And so one of the big advantages of that is we can go at any pace we want. So I'm not in a rush to do everything. <laughs> so, you know, I have things written down. I have things that I'd like to cover. If you want to go slower, I can go slower. I can take you through each step. Here's one thing I will say. Please, 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 please use Johnson as a resource. Okay. He is there to answer all of your mathematical questions. If I do an integral on the board and you go, what did he do there? Ask Johnson, okay? Don't just sit there and still be confused, okay? If I do some algebra on the board and I say, oh, this is simple to show this. If I say, oh, it's simple to get from step A to step B and you're like, oh, what is he even talking about? That is not simple. That's okay. Ask Johnson because the reality is especially those of you that want to do research, you need to be able to calculate things, right? Because if you can't calculate things, it's, it's, it's going to be very difficult for you, which is, it's okay to be confused. Ask Johnson. He's your resource. He's your guide, okay? And I've told him that. I've told him to expect questions from the lecture. I've told him to, so like we have the lecture now. We'll be done immediately after you have Johnson, which is good because then you can be like, oh, I don't really know. Kyle said you could get from here to here. Do you mind running through this? And you can work it out together, right? I mean, I'll work out some stuff with you here, but I can't work out every algebraic step because we'd be here for five hours. So just, you know, please use that resource. I'm really asking you to do that. Don't be afraid to ask him. There's really no silly question. I'll give you a good example. I'm working with a friend on a research paper now. And she uh, has taken QFT with me, all the, you know, all those classes. Every, we ask so many questions and we've taken three semesters. I've taken three semesters of QFT. I still have so many questions, okay? So please, please ask. D don't, don't feel like you don't need to ask. Okay, anyways, the reading for this week. Okay, so Lancaster Blundell, the reading is 16, 17, 18. I wrote down the reading. No, not 18. 16, 17, 36, 37, 38. Okay, much less, much lighter than the first week because the first week was to really get you all of these skills and review. So, okay, so this should cover the propagator the Feynman propagator, and you'll get a very deep dive into the propagator from this book, which I will not give you here. So please read it. And also introducing you to Dirac fields, spin one half fields. So most of the time people spend like six months on spin zero fields, not really six months, like a month, two months. I'm just gonna show you what Dirac fields are and quantize them. And then we'll work with both of them together. I don't feel like waiting. So yeah, it looks like a big jump because in the book it's different. Okay. Okay, guys, so I'm going to do a quick reading check just to see what was covered, not question. I just wanna see what you should know. So if I say things, I hope you know them. Otherwise you should go read about them in the book. 
you know what, we'll, we'll address that as we move along, okay? Okay, so what did we do last time? Last time we basically described why we need quantum field theory, right? And then we wrote down a quantum electrodynamics amplitude. And you saw that it's very, very simple. Uh, you have a Feynman diagram. The Feynman diagram describes some process, right? That one diagram is one piece of the perturbation series. And when you have a sum of diagrams that gives you the full amplitude. Okay, and each piece of the diagram gives you a different piece of the amplitude. Okay, very, very superficial. We also got an amplitude by pure logical argument, right? Just by looking at some angle and coming up with a polarization vector. And we got pretty close. We got like 90% of the way there just by making some arguments. For example, saying that the interaction Hamiltonian had to be proportional to the electric charge or the field strength or the coupling, right? We made all of these kinds of uh, heuristic arguments, quote unquote, to get some answer. And it almost worked, okay, but we realized we needed, we needed some real relativistic theory. Okay, so it was like a little invitation, a little taste. Today we're actually going to quantize a field, okay? Uh, we're going to start with a classical field and we're going to quantize it, okay? Now we have the benefit of having discussed a lot of this from in our quantum mechanics class. We've discussed the Klein-Gordon equation for a classical field and why it doesn't work. But before we actually quantize the field, I wanna just do a very brief calculation. So in normal quantum mechanics, ordinary quantum mechanics, if I asked you, I wanna calculate the, the amplitude for a particle to move from some initial point to some final point, what would you calculate? I hope all of you know that you should calculate a transition amplitude, right? That's the thing you should calculate. So given some, we'll call it U of T for the transition amplitude, that the probability for the particle to propagate from some uh, initial point Xi to Xf can be represented like this, right? So th th these are the kinds of basic objects we're working with in quantum mechanics, right? I mean, this, th this is, we've done many calculations with these kinds of things, right? So let's do a very quick calculation with this. Let's just compute this transition amplitude for the free particle. So for the free particle, the energy is p squared over 2m, right? So this energy is the Hamiltonian, right? It's free particle, there's no potential. So I can rewrite this transition amplitude like this. It's xf e to the minus i p squared over 2m e xi. Uh, you guys should kind of be laughing now because you know the very first thing I'll always do to compute these is what? Insert a complete set of states. That's like the first thing everyone does. So let's insert a complete set of momentum eigenstates. We get d3p over 2 pi cubed uh, xf e to the minus i p squared over 2m t complete set xi. Okay, this should be extremely familiar, this move. Okay, okay, then. Uh, I can, I know what this guy is equal to, and I know what this guy is equal to. So one over two pi cubed, I'll pull out the normalization. I get a D3P. Uh, I get E to the minus I, P squared over two M T, E to the minus I, XF minus XI dotted with T. Oh, sorry, this should be a P because it was an integral over P space. IP XF minus XI. Okay, now I'm gonna give you an example of how you should ask Johnson things when I'm doing a calculation, okay? So I just went from this step to this step and some of you might be a little confused. That's okay. I'm gonna show you slow motion what I just did, okay? What did I just do? So what I really did was I took this integral First of all, I pulled the one over two pi cubed out. Okay. Hopefully that was not very confusing, right? Then I pulled this guy out, which I can always do, as you know, P 
squared over 2m t. And what am I left with? I'm left with xf t t xi. I'm left with these two inner products, right? This inner product, we know what this inner product gives. It just gives e to the i. It just gives e to the i p dot xf, right? That's what this inner product's equal to from quantum mechanics. It's just a plane wave. This inner product gives e to the i p dot x i, right? And then I just use the exponent law to combine them. And then I get this. So you see, this is a very simple example of how I skip like three steps to get to a final expression. I just did it in my head. So it's gonna get more confusing, right? So you ask Kelton, you'd be like, okay, he got from here to here because I've been doing this for so long, I know the answer. <laughs> so I don't have to think. You guys have to think. And then pretty soon you'll just know the answer and you'll just write it down. So just, you know, I just want to show you an example of that. Okay, anyways, we're, so is this, now does this make sense how I get to this step? Okay, very good. Okay, okay, now I have this and we know how to integrate this. This is a Gaussian integral, right? From our path integral, these are the same kinds of integrals. Okay, so now I can do this integral. Okay, and I get M over two pi i t, what factor to the three halves. Okay, so I get this, this guy out. E to the i m xf minus xi squared over t. Okay, this is my final transition amplitude, just doing the normal Gaussian integral. Okay, and we've seen these kinds of formulas. Uh, I would say CZ, Tony Z's book, chapter one, for many Gaussian integral formulas. Okay. After you do this a while, you just memorize this form, which is what, I, what I've done. Okay, so now, I mean, this should be review, basically. We've done many of these kinds of calculations. We've done it with far more complicated objects. Uh, but, but you should be a little concerned now, if you're thinking relativistically. And it might not be completely obvious, but let me tell you why. Now, non-relativistically, no problems, okay? Relativistically, th there's something very weird here. And that is, no matter what your x or t value is, you will always get a non-zero amplitude. Now, okay, that might be very trivial, but in relativity, this has a very bad consequence. The consequence of this means that even for uh, events with a space-like separation, you have a non-zero amplitude. Now, what do I mean by that? We remember from special relativity that when two points are space-like separated, right? They cannot be causally connected, right? Because of the light cone and their ones outside the light cone. We went through all of that. Now, from ordinary quantum mechanics, uh, even if they are space-like separated, you would assume that you get a zero, an amplitude equal to zero, right? Turns out that you don't, obviously. Just look at the equation. Uh, so this is a problem. I just wanted to show you this issue with causality. Okay, so, okay, so then your, your automatic uh, intuition would say, Okay, that's, that's a little weird, but what if I just did this? What if I just, what if I just use the relativistic energy? All right, what if I just did that? And I just use the relativistic energy, right? And then I would get a transition amplitude of this form. All right, what if I did that? Maybe that would solve it. And it does not solve it. You get, I mean, you can do this calculation. You get something like e to the minus i. Actually, it's probably minus 
m, I don't know, p squared plus m squared. I don't know. I would have to do the calculation. But you get something close to this. Uh, uh, this doesn't make sense because why would you get this back? Wait, let me just do it quick. <sighs> yeah, okay, it should be this. You can ask Johnson to check. I don't know. Something like that. X squared minus T squared. Let's just say it's that. Okay, bottom line is you get a non-zero amplitude, even for points outside the light cone, right? This square root is always going to give you some contribution. Doesn't matter what your X and T is. So, so we have a really weird problem here. Now, okay, not surprisingly, quantum field theory solves the problem, okay, of this causality issue. I just thought I'd show you it because I think it's important to the structure of the theory. And what it does is, and you'll see this in detail, this is just a little, it, to solve this problem, you need to introduce the idea of an antiparticle, a particle that actually propagates in the opposite direction of what you were writing. Uh, so, you know, when people wrote this down, they thought this was insanity, but actually antiparticles exist. So it works, it solves the problem. Nature uh, agreed. Uh, so let's just draw a quick schematic of that. So let's say you have the light cone, right? And you have some point at X naught and you have this guy coming out, right? To some point, uh, we'll call it X, right? Now this would be not causally connected, right? These two points could not be causally connected because this point's outside the light cone. This point's in the light cone, we'll say, whatever. I could have drawn it in there. Okay, what, 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 what quantum field theory does is, let's say you boost into a new frame, and you'll see this mathematically way later. I'm just showing you this now. You actually end up getting a particle that propagates in the opposite direction to this point. So it might not be totally obvious, but it gets rid of the causality problem. You'll see why. By reversing these directions, you'll see. I just wanted to show you the basic idea. Okay, anyways, that was a bit of an, an, a sidetrack. Let's go to the main lecture now, quantizing a field. So just keep this in mind as we move on. Okay, quantizing a field. Okay, what do we do? What is the procedure? So the first thing we need to do is write down some kind of equation of motion and some kind of object that describes our theory. Turns out we have something that can do that called a Lagrangian. Okay, did they, did they, they must have covered this in the book. Okay, beautiful, excellent. So now I'm gonna show you how I minimize an action, okay? And I'm gonna derive the Euler-Lagrange equations for rel relativistic scenarios, okay? Uh, okay, okay, let's do it. Okay, so I can start with some action S equals an integral d4x, where the Lagrangian is dependent on positions of some field phi and velocities of that field phi, so derivatives acting on the field. You've seen something like this, right? Okay, good. And I, I love this idea of doing reading before. Perfect. Okay, so now what's the natural procedure? Arguably the most most important thing you'll ever do as a physics student, because you do this like over and over again, we're going to minimize this action. We're going to make it stationary. What does that mean? It means I'm going to set delta s, right, some perturbation of the action equal to zero, right? That's what that means mathematically. So I have delta s, I set it equal to zero, right? And I do my usual minimizing procedure. So let me just think about this for a second in my head. Okay, I have integral d4x, del L, del phi, delta phi, right? I'm just beginning my minimizing procedure. Plus del L, del d mu phi, d mu, Delta phi, I have to go a little slow, make sure I do it right. Oh, sorry, now this should be delta d phi, yeah. 
I'm perturbing each piece. I'm varying each piece of the action. Okay. Okay, and let's see what I can do with that. How can I manipulate? Now I'm gonna integrate by parts, right? And we know what happens when we integrate by parts. We get one surface term that vanishes, right? Hopefully they described all of this in the book. Uh, I don't know if they did it exactly like this. Okay, so what do I get? I get, again, I get some del L, del phi, delta phi, I'm just integrating by parts. Uh, so that first term stays the same, minus d mu del L, del d mu phi, right? Because you get this derivative when you integrate by parts, you get another derivative on that guy delta phi, that delta phi should be here. I ran out of room. Uh, plus d mu del L, d d mu phi delta phi evaluated from some phi i to phi f. Okay. So remember, we're integrating this guy over some initial field point to some final field configuration. Okay, this should be very familiar to you because what happened when we did this procedure in classical mechanics, we got this random surface term from integrating by parts, right? And our claim was that since phi i and phi f are fixed, fixed points, right? That this guy just drops out, right? The surface term cancels and we're left with this so let's just write that down more clearly. I will, I will put that up here. So now we have this. So we have del L, del phi, delta phi, minus d mu, del, del d mu phi, delta phi, plus d mu del L del d mu phi evaluated from some phi i to phi f. And we've claimed that the surface term can cancel, which is uh, expected in this, in this scenario. You will always have some surface term because phi and phi f are fixed. Now you remember when we derived this in classical mechanics, what did we have as a perturbation? we had a function that I called rho of x, right? And I said that rho of x can be any perturbation, right? On this action. Uh, so what's the analog of rho of x? That's delta phi. Delta phi can be any variation of the path, right? And so what are we left with? Well, we're left with the final condition, uh, del L, del phi minus d mu, del L, del d mu phi, equals zero. And this is our Euler-Lagrange equation for field theory, any classical quantum field theory, any field theory in three plus one dimensions, so space-time dimensions, where we recall that del mu is the space-time derivative, right? I'll just put the definition. So del mu is del, del x mu, okay? Okay. You've seen this equation in the book, right? So this is not the first time. Okay, excellent. Did they do this procedure of varying the action? You're on mute. I don't think they derived the Euler-Lagrange equation, no. Okay, whatever. Maybe that was in chapters that we didn't read. That's fine, but they got you here, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. As long as they get you there and it kind of makes sense, I will do, I'll derive it for you. Don't worry about that. Okay, good, so we've seen this. So we know what this thing does and what can this do for us? It will give us what? Equations in motion, right? That's the whole idea. Okay, excellent. Hopefully nothing too crazy so far. Now you guys are uh, realizing why I told you, you had to learn all that other stuff, right? Because now you know where it's all coming from. Any questions before we continue? Okay, let's do a quick review of Hamiltonian mechanics, which I think they covered in the book too, right? Okay, okay. 
So in Hamiltonian mechanics, we can define a momentum P in the following way, del L del Q dot, where Q dot is equal to dQ dt. This is how we define momenta. In field theory, we have an analog called pi, and we define pi of x as being del L, our Lagrangian from field theory, over del phi dot. So this is called the conjugate momenta, and we'll use it in quantum field theory. Okay. We can define the Hamiltonian in classical mechanics in the following way. In classical mechanics, H is equal to the sum over all positions. How did it go in regular field theory? Oh yes, P of X, phi dot of X minus L, minus our classical Lagrangian. This is just the definition of the Hamiltonian classically. Uh, in field theory, we instead call it a Hamiltonian density, this script H. We take an integral over it, just like the Lagrangian, and we get this guy. We get pi of X, phi dot of X, minus our Lagrangian density, okay? Notice my integration measure, d3x. I'm not in space time yet. This is just all classical field theory. We haven't quantized anything. Hopefully this looks familiar to you from the book, something like this expression, yeah? Okay. Okay, so it turns out, we're gonna work with Hamiltonian densities, but it turns out in quantum field theory, Hamiltonian densities are not Lorentz invariant, okay? They are not Lorentz invariant. And so we don't even really use Hamiltonians. So we'll quickly drop this, but just I wanna, you should know what it is. Uh, Lagrangians are Lorentz invariant. And so that's why we use Lagrangians in, in, and I'll, I'll show you why, but you know, we're just going through it. So let's just consider the, so let me write this up top. So pi of X is this conjugate momenta, so again, uh, the integral of the Hamiltonian density is equal to pi of x, pi dot of x, minus our Lagrangian density. And I think Johnson went through, did he go through Hamiltonian mechanics kind of last time? Okay, I'll ask him to. That's not so important, but Okay, let's consider a theory of a single field, 5x. Okay, let's consider a theory of a single field. So I can write down a Lagrangian, and it's gonna look something like this. 1 half phi dot squared minus 1 half nullify squared minus 1 half m squared phi squared. Okay, so this is a typical Lagrangian for a field theory of a single field, a single field 5x, whatever, you know what it is. Q of t for a single field. There are no interactions here. It's just some free field I'm describing. Okay, and you've seen this kind of Lagrangian, right? In the book, hopefully. Okay, good. Okay, I can also write it this way, uh, one half, d mu phi squared minus one half m squared phi squared. This is probably the more appropriate way. The only difference between this and this is I've split up the time part, right? Phi dot is the time part and the space part. Nabla phi is all the spatial derivatives. This has all four uh, bunched in. Okay, let's compute some things with this then. Uh, can we compute the Hamiltonian density and can we compute an equation of motion? Sure. So if you, if you follow the Euler-Lagrange equation, what kind of equation of motion will you get? Well, you get something that looks like this. Wait, let me just make sure. Just solve, solving, you should try this on your paper right now. Try and solve Euler-Lagrange right now and see if you can get the same equation of motion. So if I solve Euler-Lagrange, I get the following. I get D2, dt squared minus nabla squared uh, plus m squared phi equals zero. Now, 
we should recognize this as being the Klein-Gordon equation. Because I can just write this as d squared plus m squared equals zero, where d squared is equal, oh, sorry, d squared is equal to d mu, d mu. Okay, and I can even furthermore, you'll see this sometimes in this form, where it's box squared plus m, oh, sorry, box plus m squared five equals zero, where this box is called the D'Alembertian. I'm just showing you this because some books use it. And it's another operator that has second derivatives in all directions, d2 dx squared, d2 dy squared, d2 dz squared. It's basically like Navla, right? It's the same thing as the gradient, except with second derivatives. Okay, so we get the Klein-Gordon equation. Anyone have questions? So that's the first quick calculation we did for our first, this is our first field theory, guys. Our simplest field theory we can work with. Okay, I mean, it's straightforward. We can do it quick if you want, let's just do it quick. So del L del phi, I'll do it quick down here. And I'll work with this Lagrangian. So del L del phi, this guy contributes nothing, right? Because this is dependent on d mu phi. This guy contributes a term. This two multiplies by the half, right? And so you get m squared phi, right? That's del L del phi. And then del L del d mu phi, well, this guy contributes nothing. It's a partial derivative. This guy does contribute something. The two multiplies by the half, you just get d mu phi. Okay. And what do you get? Now you get Euler Lagrange. So del L minus this guy. Uh, I'm just going to do it backwards. You get d minus m squared phi equals zero. Wait, let me just make sure I didn't miss a term. One half d mu. Oh no, I should have another term here. Two times that guy, del L del d mu phi. Yes, because I have two of these guys up here. So I just get two d mu's. So. Okay, pretty straightforward. I mean, I hope that's not crazy to do. Questions before we continue? Let me check the time, 10.06, we'll take a break in a bit. Okay, let's write down the Hamiltonian density as well. So what would the Hamiltonian density look like from this Lagrangian? Well, it would look like this. Let me see. And you should confirm this. Okay. Look like this. Let me just make sure. Oh, see, I made a mistake. It should be this. Okay. <laughs> You're going to find mistakes in my work. So <laughs> I give you fair warning. I take no liability if, if anything in this class. I'm saying it on camera now. Okay. Okay. So you can confirm that at home. Make sure I did it right. Okay, guys. So we have a Hamiltonian, we have a Lagrangian. We got an equation of motion. Uh, before we actually quantize the field, let's talk about symmetry. Okay, that's the last bit I want to talk about symmetry of the Lagrangian. So, the most famous, okay, you guys know symmetry is going to be pretty important in our pursuit of 
particle physics or fundamental physics, because mathematical symmetry gives us a lot of insight into how nature is working. Okay, so the most famous example of this is called Noether's theorem. I hope you heard that from the book. Okay, because Noether's theorem is very important. Okay, that's very, very reassuring. Noether's theorem was founded or created by a, by a, a female mathematician, Emmy Noether, a very long time ago. So, so this is a big discovery she made. Does anyone want to tell me what it is since you've heard about it? Or maybe just guess or kind of explain what you learn? It's that like invariances when you do any like um, transformations uh, lead to conservation laws. Yes, excellent. That symmetries yield conservation laws, right? Now this is awesome because in physics, we have some deep conservation laws that can't be broken. And the most important one you've heard of is conservation of charge, right? You get a conserved charge. So symmetry of the Lagrangian gives you a conserved charge, right? That should be the main idea. So let's do that. And, 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 and what we can derive is an object that, that, that conserves the charge called the Noether current, right? So we're gonna derive some Noether currents, right? That, I hope that's familiar as well. Uh, and so this whole idea that symmetries, different symmetries in physics give rise to conservation laws. For example, translations give rise to time symmetry, right? I'm sure they describe that. Uh, so, so there's many uh, rotations rotational invariance gives rise to conservation of momentum, right? So there's many, uh, this is a deep, deep thing. It's not at all obvious. And so we will use it a lot and it plays a pivotal role in quantum field theory. So let's, let's just play around with some symmetry. Okay, so I have some field 5x. Notice I'm not even writing 5x and t. I refuse because we haven't quantized anything yet. I refuse. We're working in three dimension. It doesn't even really matter. You guys are starting to realize it's very trivial going from three dimensions to three plus one. Uh, the only thing you have to make sure is everything's Lorentz invariant, right? Which we've done. So see, for example, the Maxwell equations, which I hope you've seen also in the book. I think you've seen the Maxwell equations. They are manifestly Lorentz invariant. Maxwell didn't even know. So sometimes you get lucky. Okay, so I want this to go to some phi prime of x, right, which will be the, uh, the transformed field. And we'll just say that phi prime of x is equal to phi of x plus some alpha delta phi of x, some parameter by which I'm moving the field. So what does this really mean? I have a bunch of vectors in a field, right? I have some configuration of vectors, and now I'm adding some shift to it and I'm moving all the vectors. That's all this is telling me, right? So I'm acting some transformation on the field. So this, this transformation is a symmetry of the field if it leaves the field invariant, right? If it, if, it, if it leaves the field unchanged, if it leaves the physics of the field unchanged, then this is a symmetry of the field, okay? It's just some arbitrary transformation. So similarly, I can do the same to, to my Lagrangian. Okay, I can transform it. So let me enact some transformation. We'll call it L of X plus alpha, we'll just say D mu, J mu. Now, why did I pick this combination? Because we know in the Euler-Lagrange equations, I have a surface term, that surface term drops, but now I can always add another surface term to my Euler-Lagrange equations. It will not change them. What do I mean by that? I mean, let's say you compute an equation of motion for a field configuration that looks like this. I don't know, something like that. Now I enact this guy on it, d mu, j mu. That's just gonna move everything somewhere, right? Just gonna move everything. So now let's just say I enact the transformation. Now all of the vectors look like this. That's not changing the physics of what's going on. That's not gonna change the equation of motion, right? It leaves the Lagrangian invariant, right? Or it leaves the equations of motion invariant. So this is like the most general way to write it. This should look, start to look very suspicious to you from Noether's theorem, right? Because we're gonna set d mu j mu equal to what? Zero, right? A to imply a conserved charge. So, okay, let's work with this a little bit. Anyone have questions before we continue? Okay. 
Okay. So for any J mu, I can write down the variation on the Lagrangian in the following way. Okay. And I think this is much different than how the book probably did it, right? All of this procedure. Somewhat? Okay, good. As long as it's familiar, that's good. Very good. Okay. So let, let's do it. Let me, let me write down an expression of how I want to vary it. So I have del L del phi. Okay. Alpha delta phi plus del L del D mu phi. This is just Euler Lagrange, but uh, sort of recast by this variation. D mu alpha delta phi. Okay, so I varied my Euler Lagrange equations by this alpha delta phi. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do an integration by parts. Okay, <laughs> that's, my, that's my line of attack for anything. Okay, and let me just do it quickly. I have to think about it. Okay, alpha d mu del L del d mu phi. That stays the same. Then moves over. Delta phi plus alpha del L. Del phi, phi stays the same. That guy moves over. Minus d mu del L del d mu phi delta phi equals zero. Okay, yes. So this is just integrating by parts using my formula that I've given to you. So let me write this up top. So what, what have we gotten? Just acting the symmetry of Lagrangian. We get alpha d mu del L d mu phi delta phi plus Alpha del L phi minus d mu del L del d mu phi delta phi equals zero. Okay. Okay, and your your suspicion should already be okay. Things are going to vanish. <laughs> so what what's going to vanish? Vanish. The first thing I want to do is impose my first condition. So Noether's theorem tells me that this d mu, j mu equals zero. Why? This is what I mean mathematically when I say conserve charge. So let's say j mu is a current that carries a charge, okay? If j mu is a constant, it's just a number, j mu. If I differentiate it, I get zero, right? If you differentiate a constant, you get zero. Therefore, if I have a constant charge, this guy must be zero. Is that okay? That's what I mean. So, so I impose this condition. That's, this comes from Noether's theorem. This is, so when someone says, oh, everything has a conserved charge or the symmetry of the Lagrangian yields a conserved charge, well, that's what they're saying, that this condition must hold. Okay, in this case, my surface term is this guy, this long piece. Oh, actually, no, it's not even a surface term. Isn't that funny? This is just the Euler-Lagrange equation, isn't it? So this is just zero. This whole thing just vanishes. See, sometimes you recognize things just working it out again. Yeah, okay, that just, so I'm left with this piece after I vary the Lagrangian. Okay, it works out even better. So now I'm left with the fact that alpha delta Lagrangian equals alpha d mu del L del d mu phi delta phi 
And you should start going, wait a second, this kind of looks like something. This kind of looks like the Noether current. Okay, so we've derived the Noether current. I'll just, re I'll just write the final expression for the Noether current up here. That's just the Lagrange equations. And so I can write down the Noether current, J mu, del L, del D mu phi, just make sure. Delta phi minus, we'll call this some capital J mu. This will be the, the, the current of whatever you're working with. Yeah, and this is the no current. Call this the no current. Does this expression look familiar to you from the reading? Hopefully this is important. So did it look different in the book maybe? You're on mute, so I don't know. Oh, okay, okay, that's a yes. Yeah. Okay, okay, good, very good. So hopefully, does this condition make sense? Okay, good, okay, great. Okay, so it turns out that when we just vary the Lagrangian, we end up with an extra term. That's really all you should care about. And that extra term is conserved. It's a symmetry of the Lagrangian. Okay, and it implies a conservation of charge. Okay, that's all. And we can say that because of Noether's theorem. You should look up the proof for it. It's very nice, very pretty. Okay, so now I can define a conserved charge, Q, as an integral over all space. J zero, D three X. So what is this the analog of? Remember in a special relativity, we had a energy momentum four vector, which we're gonna use a lot, All right? So we had a P mu and the first component was E and then you had PI, the spatial components, right? So this is kind of similar, right? It's saying that the zeroth component of J mu is the charge. That's what it's saying. And all the other three components of JMU should be what? Zero, right? Because JMU is just a conserved current. It's just carrying some number, some charge with it. And if I integrate over that thing, well, I'll get the charge. I'll get, I'll get the, the value, the number for it. Okay. I'm getting memories of my first semester of QFT. This is all we did, this kind of stuff, except my professor did it very differently. I'm doing it, he would, he would cringe if I told him I was covering Dirac fields in the second week. But hey, I do things my way. <laughs> okay, awesome. So let's do some, let's do some examples. Okay, let's work with all of these kinds of things, okay? And let's look at some symmetry. So let's look at the easiest example. Okay, and then we'll take a five minute break. Yeah, it's 21, so at 30. Okay, let's look at the easiest example. Let's look at a Lagrangian with only a kinetic term. Lagrangian equals one half d mu phi squared. Okay, so the most obvious transition, uh, the most obvious transition, the most obvious transformation that would leave this guy invariant would be a simple shift. So phi, phi plus alpha. Okay, that leaves this guy invariant, right? I'm just moving things over, I'm translating things or whatever. So J mu equals D mu phi, and the current is conserved. Or in other words, I'm just really saying that J mu D mu equals zero. Okay, that's like the most basic result that I can say. I have a symmetry, therefore current is conserved. No other theorem, bam. That's what I'm really, that's the condition I have. Okay, that's, the, the, this should be your big takeaway now. Because now when we, when we, we want that in a theory, right? 
we want symmetry now. now. Now you should be like, wow, symmetry is really profound because symmetry is telling me something deeply physical. And it's not at all obvious that that needs to be how it works, okay? It's kind of awesome. And if that's not sticking with you, go read again about it. Because if that idea is not clicking, why that's working, then you're not gonna appreciate it as much because that's a big deal. That's why we care about symmetry. Otherwise, who care? I don't really even care uh, that my equations are symmetric and beautiful. I care because it tells me that I have a conservation law, just intrinsic in the mathematics. There's that, that's what it's saying. You, you can't detach the two. So th that's what I'm trying to drive at. So now let's consider a Lagrangian that looks like this. I don't know. Uh, you know, it's funny because a lot of times when I'm writing a paper, what's the first thing I do? I write a random Lagrangian. It's the very first thing a theorist will do. Write down some weird kooky Lagrangian and see the consequences of it. Most of the time you get a unit, you get you get that the universe would implode or explode or <laughs> that's that's what happens. So you know that theory is probably not great. So uh, let's write a Lagrangian that looks like this. Uh, I'll tell you what's special about this guy that I write down. So some d mu phi squared minus m squared phi squared, except now I'll call this guy a complex Lagrangian. In other words, I have two fields phi, phi squared. One of the fields is real, one of the fields is complex. I think they even show this in the book, a complex Lagrangian. Oh, okay, great. Oh man, this is, this is just, they're stealing all my thunder. They've done it all. That's good. So what is a symmetry that leaves this guy invariant? Okay, a very interesting symmetry would be if we let phi go to, uh, do I want phi times e to the i alpha phi or e to the, yes, e to the i alpha phi, where phi is some parameter that allows the vectors to move. This is a nice symmetry. This is called a global symmetry. Maybe they even talked about global versus local, active versus passive transformation. I don't know if they talked about all. If they talked about that, I would be very impressed. Maybe it sounds familiar, but it wasn't really like a big wow. thing. Very impressive. See, they say this book is for undergrads. It is, but I feel like it's a very all encompassing book. It covers basically everything you learned in a first semester field theory class. It's not like it skips over things. So it's very impressive. Now, this is awesome because this is just a global symmetry. What do I mean by global? Global meaning it affects all the vectors equally. Now, what if I did this? This is just for fun. What if I let phi go to e to the i alpha of x phi? Would this be a symmetry of, of this Lagrangian? What do you guys think? Could you please repeat the question? Yeah, so what if I took this global symmetry and turned it into something like this? Now would this, would this be a symmetry of the Lagrangian, just intuitively? Like it would say like very, very similar, like. Okay, okay, good guess. Here, I'll, I'll give you a hint. This is global in the sense that this alpha, this free parameter that moves the thing, right? Is acting the same on each vector, right? It's just a number. Now in this guy, I made it a function of X. In other words, alpha is gonna affect each vector differently, okay? So this is a local symmetry in the sense that now each uh, vector is gonna have a different alpha. So now you have no symmetry. Now your field configuration will be very randomized. So this will be a huge debate for us. How do we, how do we make this Lagrangian symmetric with this? This is the idea of gauge invariance, which we'll get to in a few weeks, three or four or five weeks. Turns out if you want this local symmetry to hold, you need to do some things to your Lagrangian. So this is a gauge symmetry actually. This is called a local gauge symmetry. 
And we'll see that QED, quantum electrodynamics, obeys this symmetry. It's a gauge theory that all Lagrangians will be symmetric under this transformation. Not surprisingly, that means there's conservation loss. That means that the Lagrangian of QED will have conserved charges and all of these kinds of things because the Lagrangians obey the symmetry and are part of some group, okay? So, okay, so we're building the language now. Very good. Oh no, I wanted to work with that a little bit more. I wanted to do some things with that before we take a break. So how did I write that now? I didn't even write the real and complex part. Yeah, I just had you. So let's play around with this, this a little bit. So I'll have alpha, delta, phi, go to I alpha phi. So this is the, the we'll call this the, the real field, the real value field. And then I'll have a similar transformation. I'll have alpha, delta, phi star, go to minus i. It's just a complex conjugate. Okay, so that's how I would transform these guys. And doing this, I can derive another current. So you should do this calculation. I get that j mu is equal to, we'll write j mu of x. Okay. I, obviously, d mu, phi star phi minus phi star d mu phi. You can write down some conserved current. That's what you should get. Or actually I shouldn't even say conserve current, right? What does that mean? Just know their current. Call this MC for this Lagrangian given this kind of transformation. Because you know, this is my complex field, this is my real field. Okay, good. Can I erase? Okay. Okay, let's look at one more quick thing before we take a break. I know it's running late. You guys are starting to realize that there's a lot of writing, right? In this versus quantum mechanics. Well, it's kind of the same, right? just more abstract with field theory, right? Yeah. Okay, it will get less abstract, don't worry. This first, first few weeks are very abstract. It's very hard to think about it. And, and once we start computing amplitudes, you'll be much more, much more okay with it. And we look at the S matrix. Okay, excellent. So let's consider an infinitesimal translation, okay? Let's consider some x mu, some four vector going to x mu plus a mu. So now I have phi of x going to some phi of x plus a translation. I've translated it. And this is just equal to phi of x plus a mu, e mu. That's my translation vector, right? Because this combination will move it. It's differentiating the field and translating it. And this combination is what? A scalar, right? A mu, d mu, right? And so you just get some number that translates this guy. Okay. okay. This should really be a five X, but I, I figured you, you know that, I, you know. Okay, so what happens to the Lagrangian? How does the Lagrangian transform? I get a L plus the same thing, A mu, D mu, L. Equals L plus 
I can I can rewrite this in a different way. I can rewrite this as a mu d mu l delta mu mu. Why did I? Oh, sorry. It should be new mu mu new mu. Why did I do that? Oh no, 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 no. It should be mu new. I want it to contract. Yeah, I want these two guys to contract. Why did I write that now? I just I just recast it with this chronic or delta. Because now this guy mu must equal nu for me to have a translation, right? Otherwise, if mu does not equal nu, this term vanishes and I just end up with L. Okay, I end up with a non translated Lagrangian. The reason I did this now, first of all, I can do this because, anyways, in this combination, these two indices must be equal, right? But now I've kind of put this in a nice form where I said, look, I have four different conserved quantities or four different conserved currents or currents, right? One for each mu and nu, right? So I have a zero current, a first, and that's, so now we can put this in a nice package, right? And we call this T mu nu. Maybe you've seen this in a, in a, in, in the book, T mu nu. So T mu nu is now equal to del L del d mu phi, let me just make sure I get this right. Yes, minus L delta mu nu, okay? So now for each mu and nu, I have a T0, T11, T22, T33, and they're gonna give me the conserved quantities. So this is called the stress energy tensor. Tell us some physical things about uh, the fields, which I'll explain. Take a break there, and we will come back, and then we will quantize the field. T mu nu equals del L, del d mu phi, minus L. It's amazing what a chronic or delta can do. It's very nice. Okay, so we get four separate conserved currents, and we also get this fact that T00 is just equal to the energy, the total energy of the system, which is also then just saying that it's equal to the Hamiltonian density. Okay, the spatial components of the field. Are again, an integral. And they're equal to this guy, I di by spatial derivatives, d3x. Okay, so this is like the energy momentum four vector, y. This guy's the energy, that's in t0, zero, zero. That's a conserved quantity. This guy are the momentums. This is just a derivative on the field, which is giving you a velocity. This is some conjugate momenta. You get some momenta out of this. You should play around with this. See what you get when you get T0i from some Lagrangian. Okay, so this is like an analog of the energy momentum four vector. It's just got other things in it. It's not so important. We use it from time to time, something you should see. Okay, let's take a five minute break and then we will, we will quickly quantize the field. Okay, that will be our last goal for today. It's not as hard as you think, it's not that bad. So let's take a five minute break. What time is it? 37, we'll come back at 45, no 42 and 20 minutes we're gonna quantize a field. I need this T label on my field, okay, I can't. I can't Keep going, okay. Okay, okay you guys don't look winded yet, so that's, that's a good sign. So Jenna, what is your overall interpretation? Olha, I don't know if you read the book too. If anyone else read the book, what is your feeling about the level of the book? 
is it okay is it too too crazy it's okay um I was worried that like I wasn't gonna understand the math but it like explains it like step by step more so I I got it okay yeah I only started like going through the book and like catching everything up but it's it's like it's a genius book in terms that it really explains everything very very well perfect yeah. perfect that's exactly what I want because I cannot do that I don't have that gift the thing is it was written by experimenters which is not derogatory experimenters do things I could never even dream of doing I just have to say that but the thing is they had to teach themselves quantum field theory and also fill in the steps. You know, if you pick up a normal field theory book, <laughs> they assume you know a lot of stuff. It's just like skipping everything, so. Bob, how are you? Are you okay? Is that, is, am I going too fast? I don't know if he's there. I'm just trying to absorb what I can. <laughs> okay, good, good. Oh, by the way, my usual office hours will be tomorrow at nine. So, oh, yes. Yes, that, I forgot. We have a problem solving session tomorrow at nine. I will solve a problem. Yes. I, I didn't solve it yet, as you can tell, because I just reminded myself. I will, I will make up a problem tonight and we'll solve it together tomorrow. Maybe I'll even send it out to you guys tonight. That would be fun. I'll make a little LaTeX document with my problems. So yeah, so the structure of that is 9 to 9.30, I'll solve a problem. Then 9.30 to 10, you ask me anything you want. And then Johnson's the math guy. I hope you remember your harmonic oscillator. That's rapid fire. We're going to do the harmonic oscillator. Okay. Okay. I guess we'll just continue. Everyone seems okay. So. Okay. I wish to quantize a field. This is the question I asked myself one morning. Just kidding. These are the, this is the question the, the founders asked themselves, you know, Dirac and what do we do? Well, what do we do classically when we quantize anything? We impose our commutation relations, right? That's the first thing. And we make our dynamical variables operators, right? That's like the procedure. And we say they're Hermitian and all of these kinds of things. Okay. We will do a similar thing here, except now we realize that space and time must be on equal footing. And as we've discussed, we could make time an operator, but sparing you the details, it's messy. So instead we'll demote position and time to labels, right, of the field. And we will promote the fields as operators. The actual fields are operators now acting on states. Okay, then we have to define what those field operators are. So let's do it, let's quantize. So we remember from ordinary quantum mechanics, our commutation relations. So QI EJ equals I delta IJ. Right? This is our famous result from ordinary quantum mechanics that this is non-zero. Remember H bar equals C equals one. So I'm ignoring all H bars. And then we have that QI QJ equals PI uh, PJ equals zero, right? So Q is position, P is momentum here, right? So remember our famous result that the commutator between X and P or Q and P, whatever, is non-zero. That was a big deal. Okay. So what's the analog to that for my fields? So now I will have this commutator, phi of x and pi of x, right? Like the conjugate momentas. Uh, we'll call this phi of x, pi of x prime. And this is equal to i. Now instead of the del direct del uh, delta, Kronecker delta, we get a direct delta function, x minus x prime. 
Okay. I hope you've seen this in the book, this commutation. Relation. Is it three? Oh, good. Right. I'm still, uh, no, yeah, it's still three. We still haven't quantized. I'm not gonna write four yet until we quantize. It, it will be four eventually, but yeah. I'm, I'm sticking to my guns. Okay, and then we get our usual result, 5x, 5y, the commutator, we'll just call this x prime. Okay, that should be very straightforward extension. Okay, we have commutation relations, yes. Step one complete. Now we know we can write the field configuration as a plane wave. The only difference now is that plane wave is going to be at each point in space time. Right now we're getting the mattress picture right now we're getting the mattress, you should read Z chapter one to get a better idea of this, but now we, we, we can write a wave. The field configuration as a plane wave at each point in space time that's jiggling. Okay, so what should I do? I should probably write the Fourier transform of 5x to get some plane wave in momentum space, in P space. So let's do that. Let's Fourier transform. So we get that 5x and t now is equal to an integral d3p over 2 pi q e to the minus i e dot x i of p t. Okay. Oh, actually, no minus sign in this space. Okay, oh, now we're making even more progress. Now I've written out my field as some plane wave. Okay, now the T's have made it. Oh, should I have a D4 now? Not yet, not yet. Okay, this is good. So, you know, taking the Fourier transform of the field configuration gives me this. And I think Johnson talked about Fourier transforms, right? Okay. I'll give you the one sentence explanation. And I've said this many times when we took quantum mechanics. All of Fourier transformation is a change of basis. That's all it is. It's taking me from one space to another. That's all. That's the physicist's definition. <laughs> the mathematician's definition might be different. I don't know how he did it, but <laughs> okay. Okay, that in momentum space, then the Klein Gordon equation, just to show you, would look like this dt squared plus p squared plus m squared of phi. Sorry, phi equals zero. Phi of p and t. Okay, and I'm going to define this new thing, omega p, as equal to the square root of p squared plus m squared. Okay, and so basically now E is omega p, right? Because energy in special relativity is this. So now omega is just energy. I'm just writing that just to give you the convention. I think in that book, they call omega p EP. I just skimmed through it and I saw a lot of these guys, EP. I don't know why they do that because all particle physicists use omega. So yeah, so I'm not using EP. So I hope that that's clear that it's not EP, it's omega P. And that's the same thing. I think they define it as this, right? Okay, good. They define it as, um, wait, oh wait, never mind. Yes, that, they that's do? it. They define it yeah. as this? Okay, yes. Good. Good, good, good. Yeah, because I'm looking at that, I'm like, what? You know, I see these EPs popping up or I should see omegas. So I figured they, that that's what they were doing there, just to be really clear that this is energy. I don't know why they wouldn't just call it omega, but that's okay. It's not a big deal. Okay, excellent. Okay, now we're making some progress. So before, let's just remind ourselves of the harmonic oscillator in quantum mechanics. 
So our Hamiltonian for the harmonic oscillator in quantum mechanics is just uh, one half plus a a dagger omega, right? That's our Hamiltonian. And we know that we get energy eigenstates of E equals one half plus N omega, right? That's our famous result. We know what these guys are, raising and lowering operators, right? That take us up and down the ladder of energy eigenstates. And we have the commutation relations, A, A dagger, the commutator yields one and A and some A prime equals A dagger, A prime dagger equals zero. Okay, so this is just a five sentence review of the harmonic oscillator. So now we know we can write fields as plane waves. We know we can Fourier transform into P space. We know that we have commutation relations. The only real difference is instead of having operators P and X, the operators are the fields, right? I think a lot of places refer to them as field operators because that's what they are. So now the, the, the natural step to do would be to write down the field as a collection of creation and annihilation operators. Okay. No, oh, that's not the that's not the natural thing to do. That's not intuitive. I'll explain. The natural thing to do would be to write down the field as a superposition of plane waves, which we can do. However, we're going to write down the spectrum of the field. So each each mode of energy, right? So, so in, the, in, the, in the quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator, you have E equals uh, one half plus N, I don't even remember, omega, whatever, something like that, who cares? You have different modes of energy, right? And you have a spectrum of energy. So now we can write the spectrum of the Klein-Gordon equation this, what do I mean by that? Writing the collection of modes, Fourier modes, right? Each little divot, each little dynamical thing in the, in the field as a superposition of plane waves, also as a superposition of creation and annihilation operators, okay? So we can represent a field like that. And that's called the operator, the, uh, sorry, the operator product expansion. Did they use that terminology? Or the mode expansion, sorry, the mode expansion. They use that? Okay, good. So yeah, so the next net, okay, see, this is great because now I can just use the term and you know what I'm saying, right? So this is excellent. So now we can, we can just write, use a mode expansion, which remember we did in quantum mechanics, right? We wrote psi as a collection of plane waves. We've done it, right? So let's do it. Let's write down the mode expansion. Excellent. Notice now I am working in four dimensions, even though I have D3P because I have some one over two omega. I have some energy, even though I'm not integrating over it because it's conserved. Or actually, no, that's not necessarily true, but I'm not integrating over it. Uh, you, you might be like, where is this coming from? Look it up somewhere. There's tons of places that tell you why we have this combination. A funny thing, I did this once to test. If I had, instead of D3P over two pi cube, if I had the normalization two pi cubed over DP, D3P, right? My answer would be off by a factor of 2 million. So these normalizations are really important. <laughs> and Feynman said, if you don't know your one over two pi's from your two pi's, you don't know nothing. And he was pretty right. I think it explains why you use um, certain factors. Like in the book, there was a little section oh, on that. Did you, did you? So what did you? What did you gather from that? 
I don't know. I didn't really understand it, to be honest. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To be honest with you, the way they that you get these right normalizations is a little hard. It is hard. But OK, good to explain it. So if you're really curious, if you're dying to know, read it over and over again. I'm not dying to know. I don't care. I know that it works. But good. OK, thank you for telling me. You have to use some weird properties of direct delta functions, actually. To, to, to get it. It's, it's very annoying. And every single field theory class, if you take this in college one day, you'll have to prove this on your first homework set. Because every single field theory problem set, you have to prove that this is Lorentz invariant and that it works. It's the most annoying problem to do. It's really annoying. It took me like two, three hours, I remember, to prove that. I had to look up all these random properties of uh, delta functions. Okay, very good. Okay, so I can write the mode expansion now like this. A string of creation annihilation operators. Okay, and then I can write down the conjugate momenta as another string of creation annihilation operators. Uh, I probably should have asked this earlier, but in the book, um, instead of d3p over 2 pi cubed, it's it's d3p over 2 pi cubed to the three halves. Really? Yeah. Everything else about the equation is the same. 2, two pi to the three halves? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll look into that. I've never, maybe, maybe they have a different factor. Oh yeah, Kyle. Uh... It might be a typo because while going through the math section, there were some errors. In in the book? Yeah. Okay, I'm 99% sure it's a cubed. So I don't know. Okay. I don't know if you should trust me over authors of a textbook, but I mean, I've written this out like 5,000 times. So I think, I think you should trust me. Good catch though. Thank you for bringing that up. Maybe you should write to them. Okay. Very good. So let's write down, let's write down. So now, what is this telling me physically? Johnson, I'm gonna need five, 10 minutes over. Apologies, but. Okay, now what is this telling me? This is telling me that at each point in space time, I have a field and these guys are describing the oscillations at each point in space time, right? So here's the best way to explain it. It's almost like I have a, a mattress of harmonic oscillators, okay? One at each point in space time. And each harmonic oscillator is doing some kind of dynamics, dynamical dance, okay? Oh, I'm so glad they showed this in the, in the book. Okay, so now we have the mode expansion, beautiful. When we, we're almost done really with quantization. We basically quantized everything. Uh, now let's just write down some more commutation relations of our creation and annihilation operators. And let me just close with some few, a few, a few key points. So we have AP, AP dagger equals two pi cubed, delta three. This should be a P prime, P minus P prime. So that's the commutation relation between these guys. And then we have this commutation relation, which you should prove, or you should ask Johnson to show that this, this is true, uh, that uh, uh, phi of x commuting with pi of x prime should not give you zero, right? But in terms of the mode expansion, you get d3p, d3p prime over two pi to the sixth, Oh my God, what am I doing? Not an equals. Minus i over two, omega p over omega p prime. 
square root a dagger ap prime dagger AP minus ap ap prime dagger okay this long-winded expression <laughs> uh, e to the i e dot x oh, wait let me just make sure i got the form right plus e dot x prime okay you can do this calculation it's long it's a long calculation if you take the mode expansions and combine them. But you know, this makes sense, right? Because this is like combining two exponentials. You'll get some commutators when you do the algebra. And then this guy's just combining the integration measures. Okay, and you should get <laughs> by doing the integral that this is equal to i d3 minus b3. Okay. Oh, sorry, x minus x prime, right, because we're going to move to position space, which you should use that very nice identity that the integral of e to the ip dot x is a delta function, right, which I showed you on the first class, which we've done in quantum mechanics many times. Okay, you can also get these commutators, the commutator of h with ap dagger Equal to omega AP dagger. The commutator of the Hamiltonian with AP is equal to omega AP. Okay, some commutators. And then I will end on one closing note. And then I will tell you where we're going and we'll be done. Okay, so we, we basically, we've done, we've quantized it. Okay, woohoo, we're done. Now the question is, what can I do with this? What are like the objects of interest in quantum field theory? By the way, you should notice these are scalar fields and no interactions yet have been discussed. Wait, so in the book, um, after the mode expansion, it also did like the normal ordering. Um, yes, very good. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, well, okay, I'll talk about that in a second. Then. Okay. This was like my most genius idea, if I do say so myself, having you just read all of the basics before. And I hope you're realizing the huge benefit to that, right? Yeah. You're not like totally lost when we're doing this. Otherwise, like this would not be, I would definitely not get this on a first run, but this is how it's presented in a, in a, in a graduate class. So, and I can tell because you guys, your questions are better. They're good questions now because you know the stuff. Okay. Okay. I have to tell you one thing though. I'll tell you at the end. Okay. What else do I want to do? Okay, so now we have something called the vacuum. This is the state of nothing. Actually, it turns out in real life, the vacuum does have particles, okay? <laughs> so, but we won't, we won't deal with that complication. Sometimes it's written like this, omega, okay? That will also be something for the vacuum. Now, if I add the annihilation operator on it, I'll get zero, I'll get nothing out. Okay. Now the idea is if I act creation operators, let's say I have a string of these guys, I get two particles out, right? Because these are two strings acting on it. Two particles out. So these are two eigenstates of the Hamiltonian with energy omega p plus omega q. Okay. That's the basic principle that these guys create and destroy particles. Okay, now, now the natural question would be to say, what happens when a field operator acts on the particle? Right? 
what happens when a field operator acts on the particle. But before we conclude with that, I want to write down that in, in field theory, we have a different normalization. So for example, the completeness relation is written as this. Aside. Okay, this factor pops out. You can, well, we can go through that tomorrow if you want. Okay, now the question is what happens when I enact my field operator on the vacuum? Okay, that's the question. And I'm gonna get the mode expansion acting on the vacuum. That's it, that's, it's a very, it's a straightforward answer. Uh, so I'm gonna get something like this. Something like this, maybe. Sorry, I, I would need a, uh, it should be a minus, and then I would need a creation or annihilation operator there, you know. Okay, so now I have things acting on the states, and they're going to give me energy eigenstates. Okay, the process is done. So now, what is the basic thing we want to compute? Well, we might want to compute a transition amplitude. Right? And then we might furthermore want to compute a transition amplitude with a string of field operators, 5x1. I'm going to write this here. You might want to compute a transition amplitude with a string of operators, 5x1, 5x2, xn. Oh my gosh. Whew. Right? So this is like the basic goal. This is the ultimate thing we want to compute, right? Because this is going to tell us the amplitude from point A to point B with field operators acting on the state. It's going to tell us all the dynamics. This is called a correlation function. Maybe they use that term. In this case, it would be an endpoint correlation function because I have n fields. Okay, this would be a two point correlation function. Now, how do we compute these? Well, it's complicated. That's, th this is how we're gonna get the Feynman rules by computing these guys. And what is normal ordering? Okay, let's talk about normal ordering since you brought it up and then we'll conclude. Normal ordering is simply, so there's two kinds of orderings. There's time ordering and normal ordering. Both are pretty much the same. So most of the time, let's say I wanna write a two point function I put this symbol in front. Time ordering. Okay. And you might have seen the normal ordered Hamiltonian. That might be something that they might have shown. Both mean pretty much the same thing. All that they mean is it's telling you, it's just a it's just telling you to put things that come earlier at earlier times to the right and put things that come at later times to the left. Okay, which makes sense because you want the earlier time things to happen here. And then as you go left, you want later time things to occur. That's all it's saying. That's all normal ordering and time ordering does. So what does that mean for normal ordering? That means that your creation operators should be to the right and your annihilation operators should be to the left because how can you annihilate something and then create it? It doesn't make sense. So that's normal ordering. I, I, maybe they described it like that because that's literally what it is. It's just telling you where to, so, so normal ordering would be, let's say I had something like this. And I said, put this in normal ordering. Normal ordering would prescribe me to do it like this. As a string of operators, okay? It's just that kind of thing. Now, this is going to be our discussion for next week.
not next week. We're not going to fully compute these next week because I'm going to show you the Dirac field. But we're going to describe one aspect of this called the propagator that pops out of this, which, as you know, is a piece of Feynman diagrams. OK, so, okay, so we made a lot of progress. We've quantized the field. We have added commutation relations. We have written down correlation functions, right? And what is this? This is basically the direct analog of the transition amplitude in quantum mechanics. That we started the class with and that we computed. Okay. So next time we will do the propagator and then I will introduce you to spinner fields. Uh, this subject is a subject that you learn takes a lifetime to master. So don't, you know, the idea is you're getting familiar with everything and you can do calculations. I think, I hope the book is helping. Safe to say, okay, good. Okay, great. I will hand it over to Johnson. We will meet, to, I will be here tomorrow at nine. I will do one problem. I will send out that problem tonight. And then we will talk at 9.30. Any final questions? I know we did a lot today, so. Okay, good, excellent. And Johnson, I sort of threw the ball in your court because I told them anything they're confused about in lecture calculationally, you could do on the spot. All right, sounds good. Good, excellent. Uh, so, okay, very good. Very good job today, guys. I'm very impressed, especially by Jenna, Olha. You guys really did the reading, I can tell. So Jenna bringing up normal order and caught me off guard. I had to remind myself. Okay, okay, excellent. Okay, I'll see you guys tomorrow or next week and I, I will uh, put the YouTube recordings up for the first one, okay? All right, thank you guys. Hold on, I'll Thank make you. it. Okay, what do I do? Stop recording.